within the Marine. So it's a good moment, I think, to bring Louise into, into the webinar. Um, Louise is going to outline some of these issues from, from the department's perspective. So I'll hand over to you, Louise. Uh, good morning, Shane. Good morning, Estelle. Good morning, uh, colleagues across the country, and I'm sure further afield as well. Um, uh, very happy to be here with you uh, this morning to uh, give you an update on Brexit from my point of view, and i um, very happy to take any questions that people have in, in this regard. So, um, now let me see if this will move. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so first key message from me, trade is going to change from the 1st of January 2021. Brexit has happened. The UK formally left the EU on the 1st of February of this year. Now, during the transition period, they are continuing to apply the rules of the customs union and the single market, but they have confirmed that they will not seek an extension to the transition period, which will end on the 31st of December, 2020. So from the 1st of January, 2021, the UK will be a third country operating outside the EU's customs union and single market. Therefore, new customs and SPS requirements will apply to trade with Great Britain, regardless of whether there is a free trade agreement between the EU and the UK. Obviously, the protocol and the revised protocol that was uh, agreed between the EU and the UK puts in place a certain um, uh, suite of arrangements that will apply in respect of the North. And those arrangements uh, will come into effect from the end of the transition period. So therefore, the, the customs and SPS requirements apply to trade with Great Britain. And I'll go into the protocol in more detail later on. So, people need to get ready for the change. Those, these changes will add cost and they will cause delays for industry. Currently within the single market, like, you know, fer ferries come into Dublin port or Ross Airport and trucks roll off the ferries and, and, and on, on out of the port. That's not going to happen from the 1st of January 2021 and people need to be prepared for those costs and be prepared for those delays. There are fees for official controls on imports and um, uh, that's the reality and we are doing as much as we can to ensure that we're going to minimise those delays. Um, and support trade because we obviously have a, a dual function. We want to meet our regulatory requirements on the one hand and, and try to ensure the efficient operations uh, at the port on the other. There are supports available to assist traders prepare and um, I would strongly encourage you to avail of those supports. The department, in conjunction with other government departments and agencies, has been preparing for Brexit for a number of years. Um, and our work continues during the year, and I'm going to go down through some of that work now. Um, everybody is interested in the EU-UK future relationship negotiations. There have been four rounds of negotiations to date, and I suppose it's true to say they have been very challenging. From an agriculture perspective, there are clear areas of convergence, but there are also uh, areas of divergence, and, and um, uh, these areas remain. Um, Tariff-free and quota-free access is a priority, uh, is a core priority, and it actually, you know, and it's the one area where both parties agree that we want tariff-free and quota-free access. But uh, especially in light of the highly integrated supply chains and uh, the, the volume of, of trade uh, in both directions. However, the EU requires robust level playing field provisions as part of such an FTA, given the size of the UK economy and its geographical proximity to the EU market. But this is proving very contentious um, in the negotiations. And um, as are other areas uh, around regulatory alignment. There 
a series of further sessions um, have uh, been planned. There's two of them have taken place. There's a, the next round, full round of negotiations t starts next week. And, and there's further uh, restricted rounds planned uh, with, uh, with the sixth round then in August. These are critical talks. But um, you would have heard Estelle saying, once the parties are talking, a deal can be done. And for me, economics will outweigh politics at some stage. So I'm hoping that that's the case. Um, there is time pressure here. We need a deal to be done um, uh, at least by the end of October to allow that to be ratified in time for the first of January 2021, as well as to allow traders and authorities prepare fully for the new um, trading reality. Um, as I said, a uh, uh, level playing field, I've already covered this, um, robust level playing field provisions, it's, it's necessary to have those. Um, but unfortunately, the UK has been clear that it wishes to diverge from the EU regulations. So it, we, we are in a difficult space in, in this area. Uh, rules of origin are, is another area where um, there are differences in approach. Uh, the EU approach is in relation to um, bilateral accumulation, whereas the UK favour diagonal accumulation. And um, rules of origin are used to determine whether your export can avail of a reduced tariff rate or a preferential tariff rate if one is available under a free trade agreement. Now, these rules are very specific and they vary depending on the product and the free trade agreement. Uh, clearly goods from the UK will have a UK origin after the transition period, including goods from Northern Ireland. Now, if you use goods from the UK in your exports to other third countries, you may not be able to avail of the reduced tariff rate under the EU FTA with that third country. So you really need to look at the, the detail in the FTA if you are claiming preferential tariff rates. Of course, some exporters don't claim pre preferential um, tariff rates because there is a significant administrative burden associated with um, with claiming those tariffs. Nevertheless, we'll see when we go looking at the uh, tariffs uh, slide, the tariffs in the agri-food space are extremely um, uh, significant. So if there are preferential tariff rates to be um, claimed, it, it's in people's interest to do so. Um, moving on. Clearly, if, if a free trade agreement is agreed between the EU and the uh, UK, um, then the use of UK inputs in products exported to the UK would not prevent traders availing of preferential tariff rates under that FTA. But there are some concerns where we would have exports of certain agri-food products to certain countries that may require health certs um, to declare the country of origin of the animal. Um, these are arrangements uh, that are normally outlined in protocols that are agreed between maybe Ireland and a third country. And um, I would advise that people familiarise themselves with those protocols as well because you may, you may see in some health certs accompanying meat and meat products where you have to declare the country of origin of the animal or there may be other, other requirements that may impact on um, your ability to export goods to that third country market where you use inputs from either the north or from, from GB. Um, after the end of the transition period, the UK, including Northern Ireland, will not be considered an EU member state. So only product sourced from animals which meet those, the relevant requirements can be issued with a health cert. And uh, it's something that people should be uh, alive to. Obviously, as I said, we have significant trade um, uh, with the UK, bilateral trade. So our, of our total exports in 2019, um, uh, which were 14.5 billion, uh, 
38% or 5.5 billion were exported to the UK. Of our imports, uh, again, uh, 10 billion of agri-food imports, again, 4.6 billion of these were imported from the UK. On the 19th of May, the UK government announced their new global tariff regime, which will replace the EU's external tariff regime from the 1st of January uh, uh, 2021. And it is clear that the UK have prioritised uh, keeping uh, tariff elimination leverage in place to support their negotiations with other third countries. Um, However, I suppose it is reasonable to expect uh, that the UK will also seek uh, to ensure that they keep food on the shelves and that they minimise price rises for consumers also at some stage. So I, I wouldn't rule out a return to perhaps a temporary tariff regime. Nevertheless, the UK government position is that this new global tariff regime will come into effect from the 1st of January 2021. And the Department of Agriculture has done some analysis um, of, of that regime based on our 2019 exports to the UK. And um, it's a, the, uh, the analysis is quite stark and uh, the estimated cost a, a, across all categories is 1.5 five five billion, which equates to an ad valorem equivalent of twenty eight point three percent. Um on beef, uh, it's it's it has potentially very serious implications for the beef sector where the UK market accounts for forty three percent of our overall exports. Um, the estimated UK general tariff cost for all beef exports to the UK based on twenty nineteen figures is uh, 724 million or an ad valorem equivalent of basically 72 uh, percent. The equivalent figure for dairy is 413 million or an ad valorem equivalent of 40 percent. So it's it's extremely challenging. The, the, the tariffs and trade, uh, are, are, it's, this is an extremely challenging place to be and um, Therefore, it's imperative that there is a, 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 a free trade agreement uh, at its core that has tariff-free and quota-free access. Of course, I should also point out that the EU external tariff regime will apply on imports from GB to Ireland in the absence of a free trade agreement. So it's not a, a pretty sight. So we have the protocol in Ireland, Northern Ireland, and it takes effect regardless of the outcome of the negotiations. It, the, the protocol is clear. There will be no customs or SPS checks on goods between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, a specialised committee on the protocol um, will address any outstanding questions on, on, on implementation, and the second uh, meeting of this committee is taking place today. Um, the bottom line is the UK must implement the provisions of the protocol and they've published their command paper, um, which is the UK's approach to how they intend to do so. And we know that they have um, applied to the EU Commission for uh, approval, uh, uh, for BCP approval for a number of uh, ports in the north, uh, including extensions of some approvals. So in terms of our readiness for the 1st of January, so I suppose over, we've been trying to prepare for Brexit or we have been preparing for Brexit for uh, uh, the last number of years and I suppose our focus has been on um, four key, key areas, operator preparedness, IT systems, staff and infrastructure. Of course, uh, operator preparedness lies in your hands and clearly we have a role in, in terms of imparting knowledge, but it is up to you uh, to grab the bull by the horns and, and be prepared for the 1st of January 2021. So um, just, just very briefly, uh, the import notification process, um, if you're importing goods, uh, 
from uh, GB after the 1st of January, you're going to have to, or your agent or somebody acting on your behalf, whoever's responsible for uh, submitting the documentation, will have to send to the department um, uh, the, the various pieces of uh, documentation required. Our staff then will be doing some checks in the background. They'll be drawing from the traces system, they'll be interacting with the revenue system and um, we will then be issuing an instruction back to revenue in relation to whether we want that um, consignment to uh, exit port or whether we want to call it for inspections. And then the inspections were done by staff down at the port and then a notification sent back to revenue um, either clearing the consignment or advising them that the consignment has, uh, uh, has failed inspection and has been detained. Um, this is just a picture of inside of our one of our um, uh, facilities in Dublin Port. It's there. It's known as T10. It's our animal product facilities where we will be doing um, documentary ID and physical checks on uh, uh, animal product consignments. It's also it's a very large warehouse. We have significant space for uh, detained consignments in the event that consignments don't meet with the regulatory requirements. This is um, another, a side picture from another of our facilities down in Dublin Port, um, known as T9. It's for our plants and plant products and uh, forestry uh, checks have been done and the HSE are also in there at the moment doing some checks as well. This is our live animal facility in Dublin Port. Um, and again, we're, we're extending, uh, doing some extension works at that facility now during uh, 2020. Um, again, so that we're fully ready for the start of the year. This is known as T7. This is a, a facility in Dublin Port where there are basically transit lanes on the left hand side, lanes one and two. I don't know if you can see that. And then there are six other lanes where we will be doing documentary and ID checks on um, uh, animal products uh, in, in, in Dublin Port. Um, I, again, you know, the department has invested significantly in staff, staff to uh, complete uh, the, con the necessary controls uh, at Dublin and Rosslare and obviously Dublin Airport as well. And this is a picture of some of our staff. Um, obviously, staff that were recruited or redeployed or contracted in, they have been um, uh, they have been moved after the no-deal Brexit deadline. Some of them have at least have been redeployed throughout the department, but they will be, their training is ongoing and they will be coming back and will be ready to carry out the controls from the 1st of January. One of the big challenges that the department has faced um, in terms of uh, preparedness for Brexit is understanding the uh, the, the the, the types of consignments that uh, come in from uh, GB and obviously we don't have that level of granular detail because uh, you know we're part of the single market so the department uh, whilst we had done some analysis in 2018 to, to, to establish you know what our likely infrastructure requirements were and what our staffing requirements were we did a, a very robust analysis based on, uh, on data um, from revenue um, that we received from revenue um, on, on that, that they got from um, manifest uh, data from ferry companies. And uh, how the consignments were described were, were put into a, over, there was a, over 1,800 uh, unique descriptions for freight units and we had to assign them into 25 categories which we've done. Uh, they're the categories that we have tried to do uh, or, or that we have uh, put those unique descriptions into. Now, what you have on this slide, the, the data just, it wasn't a full, a, a complete year's data as, as revenue had to reduce uh, the data set to remove data where the consignment description appeared less than 10 times, just in case there was any commercial sensitivity around that. But uh, it, it, this gives a very good picture of uh, trucks of potential interest to the department. Now, bear in mind, within a truck, you could have multiple consignments. So, and each consignment 
may have, depending on, on uh, may have different regulatory requirements. So these are all very important factors to take into account when, um, when preparing for the first of the year uh, 2021. So clearly you can see from the attached that the vast majority of product is coming in, trucks of interest come into Dublin port. Um, uh, of the 408 thousand trucks that came into Dublin Port, we reckon about 41% of those are of interest to the department. So it is a significant interest. Um, as I say, it is, it's an, it, it's a, it's an analysis. Um, we don't know how trade will change. Trade could change. Trade probably will change if the tariffs, uh, if there's no free trade agreement. But um, uh, you can see we have a significant interest. Clearly, the, the volume of trucks going into Ross Lair is much less um, compared to Dublin Port and um, and again the, the trucks of interest to Daffam are less in, in Ross Lair than they are in uh, Dublin. So again this graph uh, basically shows the monthly patterns for the number of freight units coming into Dublin Port over the year and you'll see the kind of the peaks pre the node deal Brexit deadlines in, in March and October. Um, I, I didn't get to analyse other years' data just to see, but I, I suspect that's very much the, 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 pre, the peaks in advance of um, no deal Brexit deadlines. Um, uh, so, so this week we, we chose uh, the week the 8th of July to the 14th of July as being a uh, a representative of an average week in uh, in Dublin Port, and the total number of Daffam interest freight units over the seven days was uh, over three thousand. But you can see from that graph that there are quieter days of the week, and again, it's something that people might want to consider um, in terms of uh, when when they're moving stuff, uh, uh, importing uh, goods from from the UK or from GB. Again, daily patterns for the number of freight units. So again, uh, this was, uh, this graph represents the total number of freight units per arrival time on the busiest day of an average week. So that was the 11th of July in 2019. Now, obviously the peak times for freight units may change depending on the day, but you can see that there is a morning and an evening peak. And again, it's something that you may want to consider when you're um, uh, uh, booking uh, consignments onto ferries. Again, I've done a similar exercise in Ross Lair. Um, not uh, as distinct uh, a pattern compared to Dublin, but nevertheless, you can see that, see that there was maybe a slight increase in uh, pre-March and, and October deadlines. Again, the weekly patterns, and it's the potential data mentors is the green line that you, you need to be looking at. Again, the numbers are so small, um, I'm, I'm not sure um, how reliable, uh, but it is, the, the, the data is, is as presented. And again, daily patterns, again, within, within Ross Lair, um, on this particular day, there was uh, 50, and you can see uh, when, when the busiest times were and, and when the, the less busy period was. So, um, in in relation to the um, the UK post transition import controls, and, and clearly, um, as exporters, you're, you have a very keen interest in this. Um, so, on the 12th of June, the UK government announced that there would be a phased application of the import control regime. And uh, earlier this week, they published their UK government uh, border operations manual, which is over 200 pages, which I haven't read uh, yet. Um, I've read some of it. Um, and uh, they, again, they reiterate their phased approach uh, to uh, imp their import controls uh, with different approaches coming in, kicking in in January, April and July of 2021. And I would really advise people to fully understand <clears throat> and comply with these requirements if you want to continue to export to the UK 
and I've, I've put in some uh, websites that you can you, you can look at. Clearly, further clarity is required in respect of the systems uh, the UK will use to support their processes and, and how customs and SPS processes will interact, including for transits. And um, I have a number of meetings, well, I've one this afternoon and one on tomorrow, Friday, um, in relation to uh, following up on some of the details. So I don't propose to go into a huge amount of detail, but just by, by way of example, I've just taken out what we know about products of animal origin now. I've excluded fishery products from this, but traders who are importing standard goods will have up to six months after the import date um, between the 1st of January and the 30th of June 2021 to submit their customs declarations to HMRC. If tariffs are applicable, they will need uh, to be paid on imports from the 1st of January, but the payments can be deferred for up to six months after the import date between the 1st of January and, uh, and the 30th of uh, June 2021. So if you, let's say for instance, import um, uh, or export a product to the UK um, on the 30th of June, you'll have until the 31st of December to submit the full customs paperwork and pay the tariff. Um, uh, safety and security declarations will not be required for six months for all goods and these are customs declarations and traders will, um, you will have to consider some other processes, um, for instance how you'll account for import uh, uh, VAT. In relation to the SPS requirements, um, for products of animal origin, excluding some high risk animal byproducts and germinal products, so from the 1st of January, there's no change in the current requirements. But from the 1st of April um, 2021, you will be required to pre-notify the import on IPAFs, which stands for the uh, import of products, animals, food and feed. I'm sorry, I should have put that in. It's their IT system. So you will have to uh, advise the UK authorities uh, at, at, pre-notify the import to the UK authorities on IPAFs. Export health certification will be required and the UK government are proposing to do remote documentary checks. But from the 1st of July uh, next year, um, those products of animal origin will have to go through a BCP entry point and there will be controls at that point of entry. So that's just to give you a flavour. Clearly there's it's a huge document, but I just said I'd give you a flavour of that. And everybody who's exporting to uh, GB needs to familiarise yourself with those requirements. And I should say that the department will help in that regard. We, we will be trying to uh, distill into clear messages what those requirements are, but uh, operators have a responsibility to familiarise themselves with those requirements also. So again, in terms of the export certification process, so we were prepared, so there were some um, certification requirements um, in certain areas <coughs> um, for the no deal Brexit deadline. So we, we had IT systems in place for them and obviously we're working on expanding those um, certification um, processes to uh, cover products of animal origin, which we have a very significant uh, number of export certs annually, um, or export consignments annually to uh, GB. So again, very simply, the process, whoever is looking for the export cert, either will the food business operator or their staff will um, apply to the department, either through uh, an Anon portal where, uh, but ideally we'd encourage people Obviously, people have to be registered with us, but uh, we have this single sign-on uh, uh, user application, SSO uh, user application, whereby if you sign up to this, the system remembers 
key information. So if you're exporting to the same, let's say, uh, consignor all of the time, it'll remember that. If you have the same type of products, it'll remember it. So strongly encourage people to, um, uh, if you're already registered with the department, to make sure that you're signed on to our uh, SSO user application, because it'll make that um, process much uh, easier for users. Th those applications are sent in through a central admin, and um, there may be queries referred back um, uh, if, if there if, if if needs be. And then um, there's there's a, a multiple sign-off stages uh, along the process, but the idea is that we will end up producing a, a cert. Uh, and again, what that cert looks like and how that cert is uh, generated and um, uh, given back to FBOs or given to um, the UK, that's all to be teased out um, in our discussions uh, with the UK. So, uh, so, the last sorry, Olivia, so I might just come in here because we're just out of time. Um, okay. But I think I think what you've illustrated today is the huge amount of progress that's happened in terms of the technical aspects of, of Brexit. Uh, following this in the news, sometimes it can feel a little bit abstract and theoretical. But what you've shown us today is the bricks and mortar that has gone into this. We've seen now three terminals that have been built. We've seen images of the staff that have been hired to manage these new customs processes on goods coming into Ireland and we'll be seeing the same thing now on the UK side. So just as a very brief closing statement Estelle, I might ask, you're based in London, you live in the UK market as such, uh, you, you shop in British retailers every day, you eat out in British food service. What's the viewer the perspective from UK customers right now at this moment in terms of Brexit preparedness? And you're, you're on mute there Estelle, sorry. Um, I think I think their focus is turning from COVID to Brexit. Um, only in the last couple of weeks we've been hearing that Brexit um, passports are being um, reinstated, um, and our engagement is is focused on those Brexit teams. And um, but I think uh, retailers in particular will have learned a lot from COVID um, in terms of uh, focusing on core products, which we need to be very mindful of, and supply chain simplifications. Um, in in that they've coped. Um, through a COVID. So I think their attentions have definitely turned to price and consumers and getting consumers back into, um, into the stores. Um, but the retail behaviours are by no way, um, they're worlds away from what they were before COVID. And I think that's the key concern is that how are consumers going to really um, ch uh, change or what behaviours are we going to see? So we'll be tracking that. I think that's quite important in terms of tracking consumer behaviour. Um, they're still shopping less frequency, which remains a concern. Um, and but then you've got big companies, um, uh, big FMCG UK companies talking, putting pressure on the government, um, saying that we're going to have to put pressure on government and the retailers that we're going to have to put prices. Prices are going to ha have to go up, um, and there could be a severe and um, a scarcity and empty of shelves. Um, and that's also something I think that's um, that's important for our our industry to communicate um, their Brexit plans now in place and um, to ensure that um, that we can we are a source of supply um, uh, to to try and avoid those empty shelves. Excellent. Okay, so this this commercial risk is now very real. So we're seeing that from our clients on the radar side, and we're hearing it from our customers directly as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Estelle. Thank you very much, Louise. We really appreciate your insights today. Uh, I think the clear call to action from everyone watching is to sign up to Board BS Customs Programme, to hire your customs agent to understand what, how this is going to impact on your business, because it will impact on everyone's business, and that's an absolute certainty now going into January next year. So with that, I'll say thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and stay close to Board BS. Thanks very much. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Louise.